Um, I'd just like to open this session by saying a couple of short words about the Charles Perkins Center. <clears throat> One of the distinctive features of the Charles Perkins Center is that we aim to conduct research related to these issues across all of the disciplines at the University of Sydney. And that includes the disciplines that address normative questions, questions of politics, and questions of governance. And we've made a very strong commitment to that through the creation of a new chair in the politics, governance, and ethics of health. So in this final session of today's uh, workshop, we're moving from the questions of what we know and what may or may not be effective policies to the question of what should be done and who bears responsibility for doing it. Earlier, we heard this uh, um, slightly creepy, in my view, uh, slogan, health by stealth, um, which immediately brings to my mind the question of the, the normative basis on which one would undertake the project of changing somebody's behavior without their knowledge. Um, if we think about this from the point of view of government, we're talking about the democratic legitimacy of state action. If we look at it from the point of view of industry, we're looking at concepts like social license to operate. And another critical thing that's come up several times today is the existence of very strong norms acting on the individuals who we've described primarily as consumers, but who can be described in many other terms. Okay? Um, so we've got at least three different levels at which there are normative issues, issues about whether a particular agent, an individual, a company, a government, has a responsibility to do something for some set of reasons. So we're moving into that normative space in this, this session. Um, and our, uh, I've got four speakers who will give short presentations. I'm going to ask Michael Moore from the uh, Public Health Association to respond, and then we'll open it to discussion. So our first speaker is David Butt, who is Deputy Secretary, Department of Health and Aging. David. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today, their elders and, an an and ancestors. And uh, I, I think it's really good that this session is following straight on from Cynthia's presentation because it actually sets the scene for what I wanted to talk about um, and makes it much easier for me not to say as much uh, because what it does is really say that what we're dealing with is something that is actually very broad and complex. I mean, we might be dealing specifically with discussion about an issue of labelling, but labelling can't be seen in isolation of the uh, whole range of issues that are impacting on the system that we, work, we live in uh, and our society generally. I mean, if you go back to the basic question here, what problem are we trying to solve? Uh, it's actually a very big problem and it's a very broad issue and labelling is just one part of an overall comprehensive response to that, um, we, which is very much a system in which we are dealing with complexity and with changing environment and with factors that make some policy propositions possible whereas others are not and I'll give a few examples of that. Uh, we're dealing with changes in society, we're dealing with changes that have occurred in our culture over the past generations, uh, we're looking at changes in things such as work patterns, cost convenience, um, you know, two, two, bread, two, two um, um, mother and father both earning money etc or a lot of single parents. Uh, but we're also dealing with that in the context of changes in patterns of disease. We've seen the shift away from a focus on communicable diseases to non-communicable diseases uh, and the shift towards more focus on chronic disease management as compared to episodic care. Uh, and that is again reshaping our health system, reshaping our society. Uh, and f interesting little side bit on something like obesity, I mean obesity is actually changing the way we design our hospitals. We need bigger hallways, we need bigger rooms, we need bigger doors. Our FDS planes have had to be refitted so they have larger doors so they can actually transport people around. I mean, it's, it's interesting the way these things flow on into actually society generally. So you need bigger operating tables, for example, if you're going to operate on people who are obese. Um, so we've, we've actually shifted more towards lifestyle factors and there's multiple risk factors there in relation to whether it's smoking or drinking or what we eat or how we don't exercise or the number of sexual relationships that we have and so forth. There's a whole range of changes that are occurring in our society that we need to respond to and policy in that context has to be looked at in, in, as, as part of that broader system. Um, the stats that were given before um, by Cynthia about the um, Australian Health Survey and the level of obesity and overweight now being at 63% for adults, which is continuing to go up. The interesting thing about the, one, the um, stats that came out of that for um, young people aged 4 to 17, the 25% who are uh, overweight or obese, and that seems to have flattened out 
Why? We don't necessarily know. Um, but I think it just gets back to the point that it, at the end of the day, labelling and information is only one part of a multifaceted approach and we just need to keep bearing that in mind. Uh, and it can only do so much and it can't do things in isolation of a whole range of other strategies that need to be put in place. I mean, Michael talked about the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s and a lot of people will look back and remember from that the Grim Reaper. I mean, you know, Grim Reaper ran on TV for two weeks um, and yet we still remember it today. But if it had run in isolation of everything else, it would have resulted in confusion. It was actually part of a much broader strategy. Um, question here about the role of government. Um, in terms of what is the role of government for government regulation and mandatory labelling. I think the point there is that the role of government varies and it must, must be very much related to risk and reward. What's the value that you're bringing? And so, for example, in the some areas where you would want government to regulate in relation to food, and that's about food safety. Uh, you want actually to make sure that, you know, we've got mandatory arrangements in place to make sure that the food is safe. Um, another area where you might have a mixture of um, mandatory and co-regulation is areas where, for example, you've got a focus on prevention, and I think food labelling is an example of that. And there's other areas where you would have self-regulation. So, and, you know, we, we, we sort of go along, uh, along the spectrum of those things. Um, Michael also talked about the process for developing this and, you know, Jane Holton talking about, are we going to get a bronze medal? I think the reality is we, we don't yet know whether it's going to be bronze or silver or gold. This is a marathon within a heptathlon. It's actually about the long term and it's part of the overall arrangements within which we're operating. So it's a, it's a fascinating debate, but I keep on coming back to it needs to be looked at in the complexity of the overall system. Thank you. Thanks, David. And our second speaker is Andrew McDougall, who is a policy advisor with Choice. So, Andrew. Well, I don't have any accents to apologise for, I don't think. Um, I do have a confession, which is that I'm not a scientist, so I'm not a researcher. I am a consumer. I'm a layperson. So I think today I just wanted to probably start off with some reflections on what we've heard today, which is a bit dangerous when I've only got 10 minutes and um, I don't have any PowerPoints either to keep me to my time. So please let me know if I'm going over. But um, I, I hope I'll get back to what I'd sort of planned to say from the consumer perspective. I think the first thing to, to reflect on is, I found the discussion today really interesting, but it's also kind of disheartening as a consumer to hear that there's so much sort of um, disagreement amongst our experts about what we should be labelling and what the science says. And, you know, I hear so much about randomised controlled trials and, um, you know, the need for accepted scientists and strong findings and weak findings and correlation and causation. And I think as a consumer for a long time, you do sort of think that our experts just know things. And it's a bit disheartening to find out that there are, in fact, very few things that we actually know. Um, so I think when it comes to labelling, we need to stick to what we know best. And I think we've heard a lot today about, you know, we, the, the things that we do have good evidence for. And I think you can always make other arguments and you can always point out other things. And consumers will always say that they want many, many, many things labelling, but labelled. But we really need to stick to what we have the best evidence for. And I think, um, I think there are lots of experts in this room who would be able to find some key areas that we can all agree on. And to that end, I think we've done quite well when it comes to things like regulation of health claims and certainly with the front of pack labelling. Um, system that I've been involved in with other stakeholders in developing. I think one of the things that disheartens me is when these discussions are sort of had in the public domain because, you know, we have the, the, the lift out in the good food about David Gillespie and, you know, we have these sort of um, quite alarmist responses to certain things and it's really confusing for consumers um, as some of our speakers have spoken about already. But I think um, I'd also look at the focus in the media on some of the more palatable messages to consumers. And um, we had someone this morning mention Michael Pollan, and you know that's an example of a communicator speaking about um, food, and and that kind of message is compelling. And I think part of what's compelling about what David Gillespie says is that it's empowering because he's saying something that people can actually do by saying, you know, cut out your sugar. That's something that people recognise, and it's a proxy for people as well. If they do that, it's not saying that. You know, I'm not saying that I 
agree that David Gillespie should be saying um, what we should and shouldn't be eating, but I think it's pretty clear that by cutting out sugar, then you're following some of the other more sound dietary messages around whole foods, around you know preparing meals yourselves. So I think consumers are responsive to sort of proxies in that way, and if we can find things like you know eat food, mostly plants, not too much, that's a really clear message, and it might be a bit easier than sort of the old nutrition with its focus on nutrients, or even the new nutrition, which still um, you know, is contested by our experts. Um, so really, I think I'll, I'll probably steer away from nutrition because I've probably said too much already, given that, as I've said, I'm not a scientist. Um, and the one thing we haven't really heard about today is labelling for consumers to make informed decisions. Now, as a consumer advocate, I really strongly believe that consumers have a right to make informed decisions. And I don't think there's anywhere this is more important than in food. And I also think that the reason we talk about labelling in food is that that's how we make decisions about food. Food isn't insurance. Uh, in my own experience, I got a letter from the RTA or whatever they're called now, Roads and Maritime Services, saying, my car red shows up, but to get it, I need to go and renew my green slip. And when I do that, I'll also renew my comprehensive. And I haven't done it yet. Maybe the nudge unit isn't working well enough. I haven't responded to the government's letter. But the reason I haven't done it yet is because I need the time to look into my options, to go online, to research, to call the companies. I can't do that with food. Food is a decision I make every day, multiple times a day. So I can't go and research every single thing I'm going to eat. I rely on the label to inform me. And this right of consumers to make informed decision making is it's actually recognised in our regulators' objectives. So Food Standards Australia New Zealand has an, an as an objective in addition to protecting public health and safety, providing information to consumers to make informed decisions. So that's the context of labelling that I'd like to talk about today. We do hear from the industry a lot that there's limited real estate. And as I mentioned, for you know, every consumer out there, there's a sort of priority list of issues that they want to see labelled. Um, but I would say that I think consumers have the right to demand certain information. And as policymakers and experts, we expect um, as consumers, we expect our policymakers and experts to sort of guide the more important issues. And I think it's simply not realistic to say that markets will respond to consumer demand for information. And the main reason for that is the, the food industry, we talk about this industry, but it's a collection of hundreds of companies and we can't expect them all to just know how to act in unison and, and to label consistently in a way that consumers can understand. And that's where regulation comes in. And I'm going to talk about regulation, but um, I should say that I'm not just talking about government regulation. There is a role for industry self-regulation, and we've seen that co-regulatory approaches can also be effective. So I think there's sort of two triggers for regulation that, that I would identify. One is consistency, and the other is public interest. Um, given the time constraint, I think we've spoken about the public interest a lot. So public health, obviously, obesity and diet-related disease, there is a strong public interest in labelling and, and regulating to label um, to, to achieve public health goals. Um, so I'll focus on consistency. And there's a couple of ways that food labelling can be inconsistent. One of them is presentation. So for example, in the UK, there's multiple approaches to front of pack labelling. And this makes it difficult for consumers to compare if they're shopping at different retailers. And you know, we only have two main retailers here and I shop at both of them. So I can imagine if it's even more difficult there. Um, there's a range of different systems. The manufacturers have their own system. So the government has stepped in and said, you know, here is a consistent approach to front of pack labelling. So it is a voluntary approach, but it's still um, an effort to recognise that there needs to be consistency, that industry on its own will have a proliferation of approaches that, you know, you can't expect them all to know how to do the same thing. Even here, we have an industry system of labelling and it's still not consistent across all products or among all retailers. There are different approaches and for a consumer, it is confusing. But I think another area of inconsistency is uh, when labelling reflects inconsistent standards. So free range labelling is an area that Choice does a lot of work on and, and consumers regularly tell me how difficult it is. They say, what eggs should I buy? And I really don't know how to answer that question because the words free range can really mean anything. It essentially means that there is some space somewhere that's close to the shed that the chickens may or may not go in. Now, does that reflect the expectations of consumers? And I would say in a lot of cases it doesn't. We know that most consumers, from choice research, we know that most consumers who buy free-range eggs, 
they do so for animal welfare reasons. And when we ask a bit more about those reasons, it's, it's about how much space the chicken has. So these expectations, these hopes that people have when they pay extra money for these products, they're not really borne out when we have a claim that, that has no standards behind it. So that's an area that, you know, maybe there's a public interest in hens having nice lives. I don't really think that's a strong argument, but we do have a demonstrated inconsistency in labelling. The market is not responding to the consumer demand and, and the industry, perhaps it's, um, you know, it's not intentional at all, but they, they certainly aren't sort of coming together and, and, and developing their own standard behind that claim. The, the standard that has been proposed is 13 times greater than the voluntary code we have in terms of the number of hens that you would have outside. So that's that particular industry's response to, to consumer demand for information. So I think that where we have um, inadequate or inconsistent standards, that's an area that we need regulation. Again, whether that's co-regulation or government stepping in is the really difficult question. And I think there's one other area of inconsistency that I'll just touch on briefly, and that's uh, when you get inconsistent application of labelling. So one obvious area is palm oil labelling. We have our major retailers voluntarily declare palm oil in products, and this is despite being allowed to simply call palm oil vegetable oil. Now, I would say that given the quite significant differences between palm oil and most other vegetable oils, that that is frankly misleading consumers by omission. And we know that there are a lot of consumers who want to know if there's palm oil in a product, whether if it's for the health reasons or because they have environmental concerns. And I think there's a, a really good argument for regulation here that goes beyond consumers wanting to make informed decisions. And that's because it actually helps manufacturers. In the absence of regulation, we have an uneven playing field. So those, what we're talking about here today is, you know, what is to be done and who is responsible and how do we define responsible business practices? Those companies who are being responsible, who are declaring that they're using palm oil, are being disadvantaged because the product next door can just say vegetable oil. Vegetable oil. And I don't accept that consumers should have to cross-reference a food label to check vegetable oil and saturated fat content to make a guess as to what kind of vegetable oil it is, when in fact the manufacturer knows what they're using and they can simply declare it. The other area it's a disincentive for is where companies are using sustainably produced palm oil. You know, they're paying extra money for it, they're doing it for you know, ethical reasons. They want to be able to say to consumers, look, we are using sustainable palm oil, but they are at a disadvantage when health conscious consumers choose a vegetable oil labelled product over their own. So I think that's an area where the inconsistency in, in application of labelling really is, is, it, it makes it imperative that we do have some form of regulation there. So I think these examples sort of show us that while we've spoken a lot about the need for regulation of labelling in order to have, um, you know, to, to try and target public health improvements, that there also is a really strong argument, and it's, it's very consistent, which is that consumers have the right to make informed decisions. So consumers want to make healthier decisions. They're not going to every time. No magical labelling solution exists that, you know, will enable or, or empower everyone to to go out and purchase healthy food and, and, and radically change their diets. But labelling is a critical step. It's, it's what we have when we're making decisions about food. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, while self-regulation might work in some cases, we really need to look at what's going on in the market and be aware that there is a suite of measures out there. And I don't think that we should be afraid to consider using them. And I think consumers expect that from our experts and our decision makers. Thanks. Great. So thank you, Angela. Um, if I might just permit myself a comment, I mean, what's happened there in terms of establishing a normative framework here is to assign a right to individuals and then work out the responsibilities of industry and the responsibilities of government in terms of the necessity to respect that right. Now that's, you know, if we had a, an, an ethicist on the panel, it would be interesting to see what are the implications are of deciding to think about the three actors relationship driving it off the rights of the individual. Uh, talking about rights of the individual, we have a, another very interesting individual perspective, um, Alexandra Ladika from the Australian Youth Food Movement. Um, so I'd be very interested to hear what you have to say. Thanks. Um, and I guess I'm just going to echo similar sentiments that uh, the right of the consumer often isn't discussed at these things and we're talked about like 
we aren't all consumers. I'm a consumer. Um, so I really want to investigate that today. Um, thank you so much for having me. I am very humbled to be able to be here amongst so many people that I, I do respect. Um, and if I do talk over 10 minutes, please let me know. I actually rewrote what I was going to say while you're all having lunch. I'm going to talk about the, the right of the consumer and how through that right we're actually not allowing them any sense of responsibility in the way that they make decisions about food. Um, as the question is, what is to be done? I'm going to talk about a couple of examples that the youth food movement are doing um, and also one example from a fast food chain from, from the United States and, and what great work they're doing. Yes, I said great. Um, then I will talk about uh, education um, and investment as things that need to change uh, to be able to allow everyone to make responsible decisions, both consumers, the government and the industry. So who is responsible? Well, it's pretty clear that we're all responsible. We heard that industry are responsible to make products that are healthy, um, that won't deceive a consumer to make an unhealthy choice. We hear that government are responsible in terms of uh, their role in, in regulation and, and, and in control of what it is is available on our shelves, you know, multiple times a day to us um, to put in our mouths. Um, and consumers are responsible, but to what extent? We expect a lot from consumers, we're demanding a lot from consumers, um, but does that really translate into them having a sense of responsibility to be able to make informed decisions in that triad of business, government, consumer that makes up the food system? We heard that, uh, young, that consumers are time poor, we're money poor, and we do have a bit of knowledge, but we don't have the right knowledge to, uh, to be able to make the right decisions the suggestion of uh, a whole food diet uh, being promoted as, as a new way of eating, we, we all kind of agreed that that's a bit too complex for people to understand and they're not really ready to let go of, of the love that they have of, of particular food brands. So I'm a consumer. I don't have any money. That's kind of true. I volunteer for a non-profit two days a week so that I can do the things I love and help other young people make good decisions. I have no time, that's definitely true. And I have knowledge, because I've educated myself, I've also been to university and studied nutrition. So should I feel empowered? Should I feel like I have a sense of ownership over my decisions? Because I don't, I don't think I should at the end of the day. And to me, this is why consumers are not allowed a sense of responsibility. Why? We're kind of, we're kind of killing their buzz, their sense of enthusiasm, their desire to learn more, because we're making everything very simple or very exaggerated. Simple stars and simple colours, they actually take us further from being able to make an informed decision. In a way, the simplicity is obscuring the need for people, for myself, to consciously understand what it is I am putting in my mouth so many times a day. This made me think, we're talking about all of this stuff, but maybe we're talking about a problem that we're actually perpetuating. <coughs> but it's not all bad. I am from an organisation called the Youth Food Movement. We educate, we empower, we give young people the opportunity to engage with the food system as it is, not with packets and plastic, but with dirt and animals and vegetation and people. In essence, we flood them with information. We flood them with facts, stories, anything that they want. And we're not doing this because it's what I want to do. We're doing this it's because that, that is what they're asking from us. That is what they want. They want as much information as possible. A young person today wants to know where their food came from, what it took to produce it. They want to know how many times you touched it for it to get to my plate because I don't want you to process it. That's exactly what's going through our head when we're shopping at the supermarket. For us, a healthy choice isn't just one any longer that's about my health and whether I'm going to get obesity. A healthy choice is one, that is about, is one that's healthy for the environment. It's healthy for the soil that it came from. We know that if the nutrients aren't in the soil, they're not in the food, they're not in my body. A healthy choice is one 
that supports the life of the person who produced it. The producer, the manufacturer, the marketer, the regulator. But the biggest issue we face is not, <laughs> is not about no information and simple information. It's that we don't actually have anywhere to access this. And that's why we started the youth food movement, because we had nowhere to go. When we do our events and things, this is also the loudest thing we hear. We had an event, uh, a pedal powered pop-up cinema, sounds very hip, um, in a warehouse, in a food, in a food warehouse, um, and to talk about the issue of the aging farming population. And um, we do our own research. We collected data on popcorn bags, actually. And the loudest thing we heard was, thank God you're here because I've been thinking about this, reading about this, talking about it with a few of my friends, but I, I don't know where to go to get a definitive answer, to get a clear answer. I don't know who to trust. There are a couple of things that get in the way of any young person going to the supermarket right now and being able to make a decision that they are happy with. The largest one is transparency and the lack of transparency in the current food system. For example, I want to buy an apple. I know at the moment they're pretty much out of season. I go to the supermarket and uh, I see there's all different kinds there. The other day I got some pink ladies on special. I looked that they're from Australia. Fabulous, they're Australian. I don't actually know where in Australia they're from. And I know that apples are stored in cold storage for up to one year, sometimes more, to allow them to be served to me, which is Fabulous that I get to eat apples any time of the year. But, uh, but I don't actually know how long it's lived. Has it been alive for a year? Just kind of hibernating, ready, <laughs> ready for me to eat it? I don't know. The way we overcome that and the way that young people and other people can make informed decisions is by giving them more information, not simple information. So what can be done? Two examples. I thought I'd pick an example from the United States, given that there's so many Americans here today. Um, and I thought I'd talk about a, a fast food chain because I guess in a way they're kind of demonized as the bad guys. Has anyone heard of a company called Chipotle? Yay, go Americans. It's, it's kind of like their version of Mad Max. It's like a Mexican food chain. They uh, have a bit of a motto called food with integrity. If you go to their website, um, you'll you get to understand the way that the animals that they serve were raised. There's infographics there promoting crop rotation over, over industrialised farming. I mean, come on, are these concepts that people want to know or are these concepts that we think are above people? There's information on there actually about Michael Pollan and, and they give you a list of books to read to educate yourself. This is a fast food chain. I went up to McDonald's website to see what they had. They said that they had lettuce from Australia. I was like, great, can use that. The thing that they're doing that is so innovative is a loyalty program. Most loyalty programs rely on um, people coming with frequency. Here's your juice card, you get 10 juices, you get your 11th free. Chipotle have a, a loyalty program called Farm Team. Farm Team, unlike other programs, is an invite only program. They don't reward frequency. They actually reward you with how much you know about their supply chain and how much you know about the practices their producers and suppliers use to make the product that you're eating. That's amazing. I thought that was fabulous. I thought, why, don't, why doesn't Mad Max or, or some other food chain offer that here? Um, with your membership, you ask questions like, how much sunlight does an industrially raised pig get a day and with that you accumulate points and then you can buy more products and, and t-shirts and things like that. But what that is allowing the consumer is a level of consciousness. They see the impact of their decision. They see what it is that they're supporting and because of that they are responsible. An example from the youth food movement, um, we were lucky enough to receive some um, funding from the state government um, through the Love Food Hate Waste program. And um, we'll be developing an online campaign, we're building an online community of producers and consumers coming together, and we're going to hold an event all around the issue of food standardisation. Sounds pretty dry, doesn't sound very hip, but people love it. Food standardisation is 
food perfectionism. A carrot must be this long, this wide at this end, this wide at this end, to make it on a supermarket shelf. This issue is normally relegated to supermarkets. Let's blame you because you're not allowing me, you know, a wide range of, of carrots that I want to eat at the end of the day. But that's not productive. That doesn't actually help anyone blaming people. Instead, we put the issue back in the hands of the consumer. We're allowing them to change their attitude and their behaviours around what is imperfect food. We'll be getting young people to take photos of deliciously imperfect produce and uh, share it online with their friends, cook it, taste it, tell us that it tastes great, so that they can begin to think, maybe I am the one demanding that there's no ugly but delicious produce on the shelves. It also gets them to think about other means of sourcing food, to get a bit of a weird looking carrot. Maybe I have to grow it myself. I certainly, that happened to me this summer. And um, or maybe I can go to my grandma's house. I mean, these all sound quite trivial, but they mean something to a lot of people. At the end of the event, uh, we are, at the end of the, the campaign, we are, we are having an event. Um, and so instead of just talking about the issue and sharing information, we're actually going to do something with the produce that is the result of the issue we're talking about. We're going to be taking on-farm waste. We have a soup disco. We have a party. We get together, we chop some fruit, we eat it ourselves because it's delicious, it's nutritious, it's edible, and then we give it to those in need. Everyone wins. At the end of the day, the farmer doesn't have a whole lot of waste to deal with. The consumer has a sense of responsibility around the attitudes and behaviours they have around what is a perfect piece of food, and, uh, and we get to have a disco. Two other things I want to talk about what is to be done is education, um, which I guess is a, in a way is, has to do with labelling because it's growing the next lot of people who are going to be here on this stage talking, talking about labelling. I studied nutrition um, and it was fabulous, the educators were amazing, but at no point did I learn about where food comes from, how it's grown, the ethics of food, the politics of food, trade. All I learned was what happens in your body. At the youth food movement, we have people who have come from agriculture, from art, from engineering, and we hear similar things. You study agriculture, you learn about how it's made in you know, a couple of different ways, not too many, um, but you don't learn much about the health impacts it has. And that is a massive gap. This is something we, need to, we all need to do something about. And we're all from the university. Come on, we have the resources at hand to do this. An education course, an institution or a system that addresses food from a holistic point of view, right from farm gate to the plate, including labelling and marketing, is what we need to grow, to educate ourselves and to educate the next generation of people who are going to be sitting in our seats. Because at the end of the day, eating is an agricultural act. And it's not something we can ignore. The other part is investment. Um, often we value return for investment in dollars, but what if we valued return for investment in social change? Impact investment, although not overly used in Australia, is quite big in the United States, um, and it's about coupling business um, with social, uh, socially minded organisations for social good, and the end result is human capital. For the youth food movement, our biggest hurdle is money. But what we produce at the end of the day isn't always money. It's engaged consumers, it's educated consumers, it's healthy consumers, it's farmers at the end of the day. And we certainly need a lot of those because they're all going to retire in the next little while. We can show the impact we're having in the community. We can show that we're needed, but we can't show always that that's going to give you money at the end of the day. So should we not exist? Accepting social change as a currency of value over financial currency is something that definitely can and will be done. This is something else that happened, that needs to happen if we're all to be responsible. Thank you.
Thanks, Alexandra. That was a fascinating perspective. Um, and uh, our fourth speaker is Jeffrey Anderson, who is Deputy CEO of the Australian Food and Grocery Council. Uh, well, thank you very much for that introduction, and uh, I'd like to thank the organisers for giving me an opportunity to talk to you today. Um, my background is in food technology. I studied food technology at the University of New South Wales, and uh, I've been a strong advocate for the food industry ever since. I was amazed um, to learn from my professors in those days of what an outstanding job the food industry does for Australians. They were doing it then, and they're still doing it. I'd remind everybody that in the 1880s in London, the cry used to uh, go out that typhoid follows the, follows the milkmaid. Of course, now milk is seen to be one of the safest of foods, one of the purest of foods, and is, is safe because of two things, one of which is regulation, but the other is the application of technology in a dedicated industry, an industry dedicated to making sure the product is very safe. And it is. But nevertheless, we do live in a against the backdrop or the context of a paradox. In fact, in Australia, indeed many other parts of the developed world, there has never been a greater range of foods from which consumers can construct healthy diets. It's never been safer, it's never been more nutritious, it's never been more affordable, and it's never been more convenient. And not only that, we've never had more information about nutrition and how it uh, interrelates with health outcomes. And I don't actually agree with some of the comments made by per some of the panellists earlier that we know very little about nutrition. Um, we know a lot about nutrition and nutrition is one of the classic uh, disciplines in, in, in health. And uh, it's through the application of nutritional science and advances in nutritional science that the food industry moved into its second phase of addressing public health and public safety issues. So the first one was addressing things like the carriage of uh, infectious agents in food through to the second phase, which was responding to um, the relationships between diet and health. And of course, those of you who are my age can cast your minds back to the 1970s when polyunsaturated margarines first came onto the market, re uh, reflecting the fact that saturated fat was beginning to be linked through to the incidence of heart disease. The 1980s saw the advent of um, greater levels of dietary fibre in breakfast cereals. As we went into the 1990s, um, in dairy products, again, we had a whole range of, of low-fat products coming through uh, in dairy products. And indeed, there are other examples, and you'll, have, uh, you'll know many of them yourselves, those of you who, who, who shop regularly. Um, but it really is a great challenge, uh, this issue, that notwithstanding the, the great diversity of the food supply, the great range of food products we have, that do reflect the concerns of nutritionists, the fact that we have low fat products, we have low sodium products or low salt products, we have high fibre products, we have low energy products, we even have low sugar products, notwithstanding the fact that there's very little evidence that sugar is a risk associated nutrient. But we have always been uh, responsive to this issue of the relationship between food and diet and health. And really, the industry has been in many ways ahead of the policy uh, imperatives of the day, ahead indeed of regulatory requirements. Um, and a classic example was mentioned uh, uh, during the lunchtime period. In Australia, trans fats were taken out of the food supply, or effectively taken out of the food supply in the 1990s. And it was taken, they were taken out by food industry in response to concerns about the relationships between trans fats and coronary heart disease. It was a decision by the oil refining industry and particularly the two main uh, oil refiners of the day, which were Unilever and Goodenfielder, and you'd know them by the, by the Flora and the, uh, and the Meadow Lee um, uh, brand names priorly. But we, we now enjoy a food supply in Australia where the contribution of trans fats to energy is about 0.6% across the population, where the World Health Organization recommendations are that they should be reduced to 1%. So we're already well below World Health Organization um, recommendations. And this was done in the absence of pressure from the government and in the absence of regulation. And it's a strong example of how responsive the food industry has been. More recently, of course, there's a salt reduction story and we touched upon that earlier in the, earlier in the panels. But indeed, the salt reduction story in Australia starts even before um, AWASH started up in Australia, even before the George Institute became interested in salt reduction there were already 
examples of uh, large amounts of salt being taken out of the Australian diet. So, for example, in 2003, Kellogg's reported that they went across the, all of their range of breakfast cereals and removed substantial amounts of salt. By the same, in the same vein, George Western Foods, one of the major bakers in Australia, started removing salt from their bed products, followed by Goodman Fielder, such that the average uh, content of sodium in bread now is about 450 milligrams of sodium per 100 grams, whereas uh, that's down from an average of somewhere between 550 and 600 only a few years ago. The industry collectively has worked in other areas, including in front of pack labelling. Uh, we now have uh, the daily intake guide on, on many thousands of food products. Now, notwithstanding the debate about its, its, um, its ability to communicate with consumers, it's still an example of the food industry moving in a direction uh, that was signalled in the policy debate, but before a regulatory outcome in trying to meet the consumer's needs for information on front of pack. In advertising to children, the Australian Food and Grocery Council launched the Responsible Children's Marketing Initiative 2009, and there has been a marked reduction in the uh, number of uh, food advertisements for non-core foods seen by children or directed at, at children. And indeed, even in important health areas, the Food and Grocery Council runs a labelling program uh, under its code of practice for, uh, la for food labelling and promotion on allergen labelling, where the uh, requirements for allergen labelling go beyond, above and beyond what is required by uh, food legislation and it is coupled with direct advice about how food manufacturers can reduce the level of allergens in their foods or reduce the risk of crossover of allergens in their foods. But more than that, the food industry has recognised that the importance of partnerships and we have indeed partnered with many organisations. We have repartnered, for example, with the George Institute for Global Health, supporting a research project that they are uh, pursuing on salt reduction. In 2007, the Children's Nutrition Survey reported in Australia, $1 million of the funding of that was provided by the Food and Grocery Council. More recently, the Food and Health Dialogue, so the Department of Health, the Australian Food and Grocery Council, the Public Health Association, CSIRO, the National Heart Foundation, the retailers, the states and territories, Fizans are around the table talking about food, re food uh, reformulation, including uh, sodium reduction, but moving on to other issues such as portion size. And that really is where the real challenge is. How to get people just to eat less, how to get people to eat more wisely. Now, we don't know whether the health star racing system that has been discussed today will be a success in that regard. We know that it probably resonates with consumers, at least our consumer research shows that. We're trying to put together the algorithm that will uh, underscore uh, the star system and we may be successful at that. But we're acutely aware that it may be criticised because it doesn't necessarily line up with um, uh, the latest in nutrition science, but it does or at least it will hopefully line up with authoritative sources on, on diet and health. And that will give it the credibility it needs. But we do need to move on and address issues such as portions. And there are really three elements to that. There's portion size, portion standardisation, and portion control. And it is indeed in portion control and how foods are packaged and presented to, food, uh, presented to consumers that we can make uh, the most um, uh, advances, in my opinion. Of course, that in itself is a challenge because if we go down the uh, direction of more portion control, it automatically has a flow on into the way we package foods. And of course, packaging is then linked up with that other uh, important consumer issue or indeed just industry issue or, con or community issue of sustainability and excess packaging around food products. So it's not terribly easy. It's not also easy to describe portion size. There is some evidence indicating that people uh, do change their uh, consumption, the amount they eat, just on how portions are described, whether they're described as regular portions or standard portions or, or large portions. But what is absolutely certain, that any changes in portion size, any changes in descriptors, and more importantly, any changes uh, for front of pack labelling, such as the health star rating that we've been working on at the moment, can only be effective if it's backed up by consumer education. And that's perhaps the one element that hasn't been discussed in great detail today. If we do not educate consumers about what these descriptors mean or what these star systems mean on food packs, then they will not be successful in influencing consumer choice and changing consumer behaviour and taking consumers in the direction we want 
in terms of providing for their ability to construct healthy diets. However, against that backdrop, there's a lot of good news. We do not have to be constrained by the information that is provided on Food Pack. The Health Star rating system, if it comes in, and hopefully it will, uh, will be just one element of a whole range of things that can possibly be done. Recently, a large number of apps, mobile phone apps, have come onto the market which help consumers provide choice. Some of these are provided by the food industry. So really there is now no excuse, not only for industry not to provide the information that consumers are seeking, but in, one, in many ways no excuse for consumers to be ill-informed about the food and where it comes from and what it comprises of. Now we're still right at the beginning of this new era of information to consumers and labelling. But at last we're reaching, or at least we can see a future where the debate about um, the importance of food labelling, whether there's enough space on a food pack, is almost behind us. But it will not be without that fundamental challenge. It's okay providing information, even through extended labelling, but the consumers themselves must be able to process the information. There is absolutely, in my opinion, no substitute for educating consumers. Thank you. Great, thank you, Geoffrey. Um, so we've all come uh, primarily to engage in a dialogue with our speakers rather than to listen to concluding remarks. So we're going to steal 10 minutes from the concluding remarks to make up for the time we lost at the beginning of the session. So we do actually have uh, half an hour for a continuing discussion and we'll still finish on time at 3.30. So um, first thing I'm going to do is to ask Michael to respond um, since we heard Michael earlier, he's not going to give a presentation, but he's going to respond to what we've just heard from the other four speakers, and then we'll go into questions. Um, thanks very much, it? Paul. What, yeah. what I'd like to start uh, with um, and then come back to is, uh, what is it? Is it the nanny state or is it good stewardship? And, uh, and, but before I do that, I want to uh, wrestle a bit with what uh, David said about complexity uh, of the issue. Just the Public Health Association alone, I just made a quick list of the sorts of things that we play, the sorts of areas we play in, in regard to this. And it's physical exercise, it's international treaties, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Agreement, it's environment, it's uh, sustainability, GM foods, things like that, it's food security, agriculture, and uh, let's not forget the role of the National Food Plan and our national uh, nutrition policy being uh, developed, regulation, education, uh, animal welfare, and of course, you can't do anything without um, in Australia without taking into account economics and the importance of the surplus. Um, <laughs> uh, that may vary depending on what happens. Um, but, I, but I think that when it boils back to it, we have to ask our que ourselves that question about uh, the steward or the nanny state. Now, when, I'm, when I hear people talking about the nanny state, it almost always comes uh, from, uh, from big industry. And when they're talking about the nanny state, I always think, yeah, it's okay for you because at the moment, mm. you have domination. They have domination of marketing, marketing of uh, junk food to children, for example. Uh, they have uh, domination of, of general information uh, that comes to it, notwithstanding some of the positive things that uh, Geoffrey has said about industry, which I, which I don't disagree with. Um, but, th but there is a domination. And actually, if we're gonna have good stewardship, we have a choice. We either spend huge amounts of money matching, matching their marketing, or we can use systems of regulation, as Angela was saying, through self-regulation through to uh, um, hard uh, letter law, in order to equal that balance to make sure that the domination doesn't just come from, uh, from industry. And I think that's actually the challenge for us. That's one of the things we're trying to do with, uh, with the labelling. But on its own, it's not enough. Right, we've had an amazingly wide range of perspectives in the last hour, um, so I think we will open it up to questions from the floor at this point um, and see where the discussion leads. Bill Shrapnel, nutritionist. Question for Geoffrey Anderson. Uh, Angela made a case for regulation, and before lunch, uh, Bruce Neal. Uh, seem to infer that uh, without regulation, food industry wouldn't do anything at all. 
Um, I, I disagree with that. You made the case uh, of trans fats where it was totally an industry initiated move. I think there are other examples, for example, in soft drinks, uh, the trend uh, towards uh, less sugar sweetened beverages uh, has been going on for, what, 15 or 20 years. Uh, the fat content, uh, sorry, the type of fat that McDonald's uses uh, was changed of their own volition. Uh, KFC was forced to, to follow. So uh, there are lots of examples of um, non-regulatory approaches. But my question to you is, uh, to what extent do you think, or does the industry think, that regulation is useful or otherwise? Well, we, we very much take as our guide the... Um the Council of Australian Governments guiding principles on policy and regulation and that and I advise everybody to go and read it because it's really quite instructive but that really sets out the framework for uh, concepts of regulation and why you justify it but more importantly it sets out the concept of a pro proportionality of regulatory response so for very important issues and certainly food safety and the levels of toxins in food the food industry agrees that you know, regulation is, 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 a, is a key way of, of helping guiding the industry uh, to make sure that the foods are safe from, from things like physical and chemical and microbiological agents. We also recognise that the food industry itself you know, has a role to go above and beyond those regulations if it uh, possibly can. There are other areas where um, it's less obvious how regulation can be uh, effective or its role. And in the area of preventive health, there is a less direct tie between the consumption of any particular foods and a particular health outcome. And we think that, that uh, co-regulatory or even self-regulatory approaches are a better way of going in that regard. And indeed, the ACCC recognises the role of industry codes. And it, in fact, says that in many cases, industry codes can go above and beyond and create standards for the community, which are higher than you can actually do with regulation. And many industries use industry codes. So you know, the, the academics have their own codes of conduct in, in universities. Journalists, as I continually remind them when they say, but doesn't regulation work, you know, journalists have their own codes of conduct and codes of ethics, and I throw it back to them. Well, do they work for you? And of course, these codes in 19, well, maybe not 99% of the case with journalists, in most cases for journalists, do apply. And it's certainly the case uh, in the food industry. People say that the reason why you bring in regulation is because it then applies to the whole of the industry. But let's take menu board labelling in New South Wales, for example, and now followed up in South Australia in the ACT. When that regulation came in, we were discussing with the government that we could bring in an industry code. So the AFGC represents the quick service restaurant sector, and we said we can bring in an industry code for menu board labelling, which will cover all of the major um, fast food outlets. Now, for reasons best known to New South Wales, they decided that an industry, a, a regulatory approach would be better. They brought in the regulation, but what does the regulation do? It exempts any chain that has, I think it's uh, less than 20 outlets. So, in fact, through regulation, they've effectively achieved what we were proposing anyway through a code of conduct. So, I think one of the important things is that it's, neither, it's not that regulation is good or bad, it's that we need to make sure that when we're applying regulation, it meets the Council of Australian Government's guiding principles, which all states and territories have signed onto, by the way, guiding principles for good regulatory practice, and that we also look at other regulatory options, including self-regulatory options, and indeed other policy options. And that's all the food industry asks. Let the regulation be justified, let any policy be justified, and let's have a discussion about the best way to address these problems. Sorry, can we ask the speakers to give their name and affiliation again as before? That yeah, be... my name is Brian Jones, I'm from the University of Sydney. Mm -hmm. And we heard somebody this morning speak about the obesogenic environment that we live in. I know that when I go to at least the major supermarkets, we get whole rows of soft drinks, whole rows of uh, crisps, uh, and etc. Um, my question is for Alexandra. What do you think that we need to do? What do you think 
um, needs to be the changes that we'll see with the youth, so starting with the youth perhaps, that will change, lead to significant changes in that obesogenic environment that we are currently in, you know, that unhealthy obesogenic environment that we're currently in. What can the youth do? Big question. Um, I think the biggest thing is to allow them to understand that they don't just have one or two places that they can source their food. Um, if you don't want to be exposed to aisles of Coca-Cola or lollies, don't put yourself there. Um, that's a responsible choice that you make to put yourself in a supermarket. This is not to say that supermarkets are bad places. They have a very important role in our food system, but there are other ways to uh, source food. Um, and I think that allowing young people and the broader public to understand that there's not only a one-stop shop uh, is really the first step to them um, being able to make informed decisions. Um, I also think there's a bit of uh, just an interesting, uh, I guess, place that we're in in terms of thinking that anything that happened in the past is, is old and bad. Some people think that things that happened in the past are wise. Um, and in the past, we used to shop at multiple places to get our food, not just one. Um, and perhaps there are value in, in the way that we've done things previously and that we should take that into consideration with how things are done today to be able to think about how we do things in the future. Can I add, can I add just Absolutely. a little element onto that? Uh, you know, here, Alexandra, they are wrestling with the notion of personal responsibility and how important uh, it is, and uh, particularly in this area of food, and her interest and her understanding of food is obviously very, very uh, high. I have to say, I don't think that's common. I think actually the vast majority of people aren't that interested in their food and, nu uh, and nutrition. The vast majority of young people actually are going to go into the supermarket, are going to be put in a, 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 a obesogenic uh, circumstances, are going to shop at uh, fast, food, uh, fast food chains. Um, and actually there is a balance between how much, much self-responsibility uh, plays a role and the role that government, regulation, industry, uh, community as a whole plays in ensuring that the environment in which uh, people operate makes that choice easier for people who are less educated, who have less time, uh, who aren't interested. Uh, and I think, it's a, I think it's a really important um, balance and, uh, and the emphasis I hear you giving uh, I think actually uh, carries us the, in the wrong direction rather than the right direction. I, uh, I meet plenty of young people, some that are as educated as myself have gone to university and others who have, who have only finished year 12. Um, I was served the other day at the supermarket by a young girl who uh, was an IGA um, and she didn't actually know what an eggplant was. Yeah. I must admit that before I got into the youth food movement, I didn't know what an eggplant looked like on a plant because I've never been exposed to it. So I guess, yeah, I have a detailed level of understanding, but there's also a basic level of understanding that a lot of young people aren't getting from the current food system. Which brings us back to the themes about education that we heard in the earlier session. Yeah. Um, a woman at the front there. Hi, my name is Hui Hui. I'm a student at the Faculty of Health Sciences in University of Sydney. And um, you know, my question is actually regarding the education of health literacy. I think as we have all um, discussed today that eating is a, an activity embedded in cultural norms and um, models. And I was just wondering, you know, with the exposure that we are receiving today in, in our generation, what are some strategies that will be feasible in, in this highly globalized world where we are presented with different health models? And let me give an example, right? I'm actually from Singapore. I'm an international student. And I guess Singapore is in a place where we really get exposed to both the Eastern and the Western models of health. And personally, I'm brought up in a family that consumes traditional Chinese medicine. And that is the model that we look at health. So as I was sharing with some gentlemen during lunch, we look at how different elements of heat, water, air, and the earth are, are in different kinds of food. So for example, in winter, I'm encouraged to take more ginger, not because of calories or protein or, or all these 
measurements of nutrition, but for its warming factors and the fact that it's good for the body in these kinds of climates. So I'm just wondering, with all the experts here today, what are some of your thoughts about you know, um, incorporating some of these other health models in the way we look at food, in the way we look at diets, and the way we function in our daily lives? So Thank would you. anybody like to pick that up? I wouldn't mind, start I wouldn't mind <coughs> starting because I happen to be at uh, a World Health Organization meeting assembly where somebody from Singapore, a very senior bureaucrat from Singapore, was explaining uh, the very same sorts of obesity issues that they're wrestling with and how they're dealing with them in their fast food system, which was in food halls. And, uh, and the challenge for them came down to labelling, but also um, working with the manufacturers, the whole food chain, as well as the shop producers, uh, about changing, and one example they gave was from uh, um, uh, rice, one form of rice to uh, another form of, uh, of uh, rice. Uh, there, was a, there was a range of options, different oils uh, to cook in and so forth to try and get a uh, healthier environment. And, uh, and so, of course, you have to work in the cultural context. I think in Australia it's actually even more challenging in some ways. And my son, who happens to live in Sydney because I was down here, Last night took me out to uh, to eat um, Japanese. It was very, it was uh, fabulous, and uh, we had the sushi train uh, going by. Brilliant. Um, but you know, the, you're always still making an assessment about food. Should we be enjoying our food? Great. Should we be enjoying the variety of food we've got in Australia, and particularly the multicultural uh, style of food? Absolutely. But let's not lose sight of where most of our eating takes place and where most of our food. It comes from and try and work with the same sorts of issues that the Singapore government is wrestling with and, the, and that our governments are wrestling with because we know that economically, even if nothing else, even if you took the health aside, economically the costs of the obesity epidemic are going to be extraordinary. Actually, uh, if there are questions from the floor, I'm not going to butt in, so there we go. I do have a maybe at the end. Sorry, um, I'm Sam Torres. I'm the Director of Policy at the New South Wales Food Authority. So I get the challenge of being at the coalface of all these ideas many of you are talking about today, including the joy of menu labelling with Geoffrey and the AFGC. I just had a question for... It's fun for us too. <laughs> and the front of pack project with Michael as well and Angela. Um, I think my question's mainly for Angela and Alexandra, that we're in a context at the moment of a very complex regulatory framework that there seems to be a disconnect in their knowledge and understanding of in this room, that there's not a single national decision maker, there's not a single pathway, and Fazans itself has been referred to a few times as the national regulator, and they in fact are not. They set standards. Then it's up to the states and jurisdictions to in fact enforce, monitor compliance, regulate all of those aspects. I was wondering, given that all of the issues that you guys, or most of the issues that you guys identified as being of importance in food labelling, were more consumer values under the Blewett kind of scheme, and therefore amenable to non-regulatory measures in the first instance. In a context of shrinking budgets, shrinking resources, and food safety, public health regulation being our primary focus, how do you suggest we make those decisions, given that what you're suggesting is completely counter to a total national review of food labelling law and policy that just completed? I'm happy to start with that and thanks Sam. I think the other complexity obviously is that um, Fazans also has a ministerial group that sits above it that is responsible for policy anyway. So it's a really complex system and I, I frankly think that probably works in the industry's favour a lot that it is so difficult for consumers to know where to go when they sort of want to achieve change and it's certainly difficult from the position of an advocacy group that's self-funded and I think there's probably a few people here who share uh, the same difficulties. But that aside, I think I don't agree with the Blewett approach to, to regulation. I do agree, obviously, that uh, food safety is a critical issue and I think that's probably one area where there is a duality of interest between industry and regulators. Uh, you know, it, it, nobody wants to buy the, the food that made everyone sick. You know, it, there's, it, it's just catastrophic for businesses when there is a food safety issue. So there is a very strong interest in, um, in within food companies to, to work towards better food safety practices. But I don't really accept this idea that we, we should preserve all of our regulation for the sort of food health and safety issues. I think um, at the end of the day, consumers 
um, that they fundamentally need to have information and we, we do allow industry multiple opportunities to, to get things right. And I think the examples that I used, I chose carefully. There are areas where there are either considerable inconsistencies or uh, vagueness to the point of people um, being misled. And I think that where there are those, I, I don't think the market failure, which is the blue approach, is really an effective way to identify where we need to step up from um, industry-led approaches to regulation either. I, I think um, there are simply some issues where it is clear that what is currently happening on labels is either not helping consumers make informed decisions or arguably misleading them. And I think with free range, that, that's what we've seen with the ACCC as a regulatory body stepping in and saying, you know, they're looking for these claims. Unfortunately, um, the reason why Choice as an organisation doesn't think that it's good enough for consumers to just leave it to our consumer protection bodies on things like free range is that they might get some tip-offs of individual operations that are, you know, selling things as free range that come from um, operations with very poor standards, but that doesn't really mean anything for the remainder of the product that we don't really know anything about. So I think it's those areas like free range, like palm oil, where there is clearly um, a failure of industry to label for consumers to be able to make informed decisions that, that we need to have some more action. And I think it was really good to see that with country of origin labelling. Um, I, that's the example that I would alway, always give. We do have mandatory country of origin labelling in Australia for the majority of food. That's a consumer values issue. There, there is no health issue there. If there, if there is a perception of health, it's a, it's a misperception. So um, I think there is a space for consumer values labelling, but I think we have to choose our issues carefully. Um, because, as I said, for every, every issue, there's a, a group of consumers who think that that's a priority. So we do need to do work, more work in that area, um, but we need to do it carefully. Um, I don't have much more to add other than, um, I guess, in light of dwindling resources, ensuring that if um, any breaches are made in terms of labelling or misconduct or misguidance, then um, that uh, um, penalties are uh, equally strong. Uh, I was just reading this morning, someone shared with me a story, a story about coals and they're fresh uh, baked today, uh, that they perceive that as being baked in Ireland, frozen, shipped, and then reheated today. And the April Triple C see it as today means today. Um, they will find $61,000. Is that a fair amount? Maybe not. Okay. Um I actually have a question I'd rather like to put to the panel myself, which might um, perhaps bring this discussion together. So we've, on this panel, we've got somebody who's talking about these issues from a grassroots advocacy point of view, from an organized consumer advocacy group point of view. We've heard some very interesting remarks from Jeffrey about the proactive role of industry in seeking out things that can be done. And Michael's given us a lot of information about the current, uh, I guess, well, both Michael and a number of people earlier in the day have you know, given us uh, a lot of interesting information from a public health perspective. So my question really for the whole panel is, what, effect, what practical measures could be taken to actually build alliances between all of these different sources of positive change? What could be done to get these different sources of positive change acting together? If you uh, read uh, Rob Moody and Bruce Neal's article in The Lancet, about uh, how health groups um, interact with uh, industry. Um, and they are really specific about junk food, I have to say, uh, industry, alcohol and tobacco. You'd say you don't. That's, that's actually the thrust of the article. Don't, can't be done, it's a, it's a, it's a ploy. Um, I have to say, when Jane Holton asked the Public Health Association to come on board in terms of the, um, the star, what turned out to be the star labelling system, I was extraordinarily reluctant, just the same as uh, I had been reluctant uh, to go into the food and health dialogue uh, for this reason. The thing that's different in terms of negotiating uh, those terms is government is there. And I think that that is actually a really important thing. Now, Jeffrey and I have worked out quite a lot of things together, especially around, uh, around the food labelling and, and wrestled with some great difficulties. And it's been a very positive experience. Um, and that has taken me by surprise. Uh, and so I think there is room uh, for I think there is room uh, for us to move. Where we feel we don't have room, and my association feels we don't have room, is to take money from the industry in order to do these things, because we think that then will tie our hands and actually creates a completely wrong perception 
uh, of, uh, of um, what's going on. So, um, uh, but, there is, but there is room to work together. And I think I would have gone down much more uh, stronger regulatory path had I not been in the process and gone through what Geoffrey describes as the Australian regulatory mm. um, system. I, I understand that system, but I would have gone down a more a stronger regulatory path. I have, and here's the last point. What I have been convinced is that the, if we start with self-regulation, industry will sort out all the problems. You know, when governments try and regulate, there's lots of issues they have mm. to deal with and they generally make bureaucratic uh, decisions about them, which are uh, often quite sensible, but it's very difficult to do. If industry, if we've already had self-regulation, industry sorts all those out for you. And, uh, and so the next step, if industry is not, uh, ha if they don't have widespread uh, take up of, uh, of what you're trying to regulate, that's when you move it to the next, that's when you move it to the next level. So I think that's how you work. Just, yeah, to add to what Michael's saying, I mean, you know, you can make all the greatest policy in the world, you can do all the policy development you like, but if you can't implement it, then it's useless. And You've tended to see that a bit in the food, you know, labelling issues over the years. That you know, people have stood in their various corners and shouted and said, "We've got the solution." And of course, um, the greatest thing for government about not doing something is when you've got dissidents. So, if you're actually going to get real policy change, I mean, you often see from an academic position or from a researcher or advocacy position, "No, this is what should happen," and you go away and do it, and someone else take responsibility. What we had in this situation, where we've got an agreement to a voluntary approach, is that in fact we brought all the stakeholders together so that you've ended up with a coalition of voices in unity about this is the approach we should take at this time, taking into account the environment that we're operating in and you know, what, what, what is achievable. I mean, and I liked Cynthia's comments about the CDC and winnable battles. Uh, I mean, you look at what's happening in food labelling um, at the moment and the progress we've made and compare it to other areas of public policy. And I'll use tobacco, even though tobacco is obviously totally different to food. Um, and you know, you know, you need food. You don't need any tobacco. Um, I mean, one of my policy responsibilities is front of pack. It's sorry, not front of pack. Well, it's that too. But uh, t tobacco plain packaging, um, and that's world leading stuff. But again, it hasn't been done in isolation of a whole range of other things that we're doing to impact on it. And we couldn't stand up in the World Trade Organization or internationally and argue for what we've done on uh, tobacco plain packaging if we didn't have 40 years of history of change where we have actually incrementally moved the system to a position where we can lead the world on something because of everything that's gone before. So if you're going to really, you know, I mean, going to really impact on policy change, it's, it's the, the process we've gone through has been very important in looking at it as a change management basis, which often people don't understand policy implementation is change management. So it's about, yes, having your vision and yes, having your answers, but where's your, where's your coalition that's going to actually support implementation and get the early wins and then press forward and make sure that you keep on taking the next steps. Yeah. Jeffrey, you Look, my view is that the sort of um, initiatives that we've seen over the last few years that have come either from industry or have come from industry government partnerships or indeed industry government non-government partnerships mm -hmm. reflects a broader change in community values across the board. Mm. We're discussing things these days that 40 years ago wouldn't have even crossed our mind. You know, 40 years ago, the concept of corporate social responsibility mm. probably didn't even exist. But now it's embedded in many food companies. The people who work in those food companies understand what it means, and they take great pride in working for companies that are trying to do the best by consumers in the best way they can, notwithstanding the fact that they do have to make a profit, and indeed they have to make a profit in order to affect the changes in their products that are called for by the change in community values. But it's not only the industry that has changed. I mean, we must remember that 40 years ago, even government was doing things that now we wouldn't find acceptable, and you know, forced adoption of children is one of the things. So the whole community has changed, and community values have changed. And that's really what you're seeing in this approach now that, that, that enables the food industry to become engaged with, with other sectors. The thing that disappoints me a little bit is that not many people, well, actually a lot of people have caught up with that, but there are still a few people who haven't, who still um, uh, disparage the food industry and, and claim that it is irresponsible and that they're only interested in making money and it's the only way 
that they measure their, their success in the, in, in the community and in business. So that is what I say, and that's why I'm still quite optimistic about the fact that we can continue to work with um, organisations such as Michael's and the Hart Foundation, who we've worked with, um, and, and, and Angela's as well, of course. So who knows uh, what will happen next? All of which assigns a fairly fundamental role to the kind of work that Angela and Alexandra have talked about as a driver, of, an ultimate driver of change. So would either of you like to have the last word? Um, yeah, and I think I don't want to end on a bad note, but I would say that um, the experiences of the last year or two have sort of shown me the limits of, um, of community organisations working with industry to achieve change, and it's frankly all about the, the parameters that decision makers put around those processes if they're going to be effective. And I don't think it's people disparaging the food industry. I think Bruce Neal eloquently pointed out that it is the food industry's job to sell product and, and there are ways of doing that that involve making food tasty and marketing it well. And I think um, amongst the people who sort of say that perhaps there shouldn't be such a strong role for the food industry are, are people like me, but also people like Margaret Chan. And I thank my, one of my public health colleagues for forwarding me Margaret Chan's speech where she said, when industry is involved in policy making, rest assured that the most effective control measures will be downplayed or left out entirely. And I think with the, the front of pack example, we all essentially went along with the process because we had no alternative. But it was really, um, it was limited by the fact that the decision makers said it would be a voluntary system because it means that the industry representatives were able to say if something sort of, a, a strong public health or consumer you know, benefit um, approach was put forward, well the response was, if the industry doesn't like it, they won't use it. It's a voluntary system and we want something widespread. So it's not to disparage the industry, it's to recognise that there are limitations around collaborative uh, stakeholder approaches. And then at the end of the day, consumers elect governments and, and governments you know, select ministers. And I think it's time for, for our decision makers to actually step up and, and have some guts when it comes to food. Okay. So before we uh, thank our speakers, I just want to make a few very brief closing remarks. Um, so I'd like to uh, acknowledge with uh, considerable gratitude the New South Wales government for supporting this event, as well as the University of Sydney, of course. Um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that a lot of people in the audience are very busy people with a lot of claims on their time, and we're extremely grateful for you making so much time to give attention to, to this event. Um, it's been very gratifying for us. It's a very informed audience. It's a remarkable group of people to have in one room, and that's, that's very pleasing to all of us. Um, so on behalf of myself and the, the US Study Center, the other co-organizing body, thank you all very much for that. And in particular, thank you to our quite extraordinary group of speakers that we've listened to today. Thank you.